We're going to start here in a second. We got some more people coming in. How's everyone feeling? You guys can take yourself off mute. We're just going to hang out. Hey. hey. <laughs> Your audio is a little low, Agit. I think it sounds like something's blocking your speaker, maybe. Agit, you want to go ahead and try to talk again? Nope. <clears throat> so you all may or may not meet our cats, depending <laughs> on how lucky you are. We've got a question. Up. Is, that, is everyone wearing sweatpants today? Is that is that what uh, everyone's got nice shirts on, but sweatpants down I below? Have, I have jeggings on. I have jeggings. There you go. All right. Well, I am in jeans. <laughs> in my regular uniform. We're gonna give Agit some time to uh, to to dip out and dip back in. Um, while he's doing that, I'll go ahead and just get us started a little bit. Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is the Really Startups, How Has COVID Changed Early Stage Entrepreneurship? I have notes right here, so I'm not gonna, I'm being vulnerable and let you know that I may look down and look at them. My name is Michelle Graham. I'm the Technically DC Market Editor, um, so I cover the entrepreneurship. There's a cat, D. I cover the <laughs> entrepreneurship tech startup community here in the DC region. Parts of Maryland, also Northern Virginia, as Amazon is moving in there as well. Um, but today we'll be discussing um, basically how early stage entrepreneurship is changing. So to kick off, if you guys want to all take a chance, panelists, um, to introduce yourselves, tell us what region you're in and what you do for work. Well, would you like me to start? Hi, everybody. And yeah. my video, I'm at the very top, so I don't know how that works for everybody else. But hi, my name is Matt Gillis. I'm the CEO of Clean.io. Uh, we're a Baltimore-based startup, and um, we protect enterprises and their end users from untrusted code execution. Um, quickly that, uh, you know, you, you may be familiar with when you're on your mobile phone and you're on a website and all of a sudden the web page redirects uh, to a page that says, congratulations, you've won an Amazon gift card. Uh, that is considered untrusted code and you're welcome. We stopped that problem. So that's what we do. Uh, I'll throw it over to maybe to Sandeep because he's next on, on the line from what I can see. Well, perfect. Uh, hey, I'm Sandeep Konam. Uh, I'm co-founder CTO of Abridge AI Inc. So, I don't know how many of you have experienced this thing, but uh, as patients, when we engage in clinical conversations uh, with doctors, oftentimes there's a lot of information being exchanged. And sometimes we are anxious, sometimes we're absent-minded uh, and really sick uh, more than anything. And we might not remember all the doctor's advice, recommendations, treatment plans, so on and so forth, when we really need it. So using our bridge, uh, we can capture the details of our care uh, by securely recording these clinical conversations happening across the care continuum from home to hospital and stay on top of our health. And we are based out of Pittsburgh. Uh, Dee, do you wanna go next? Sure, thanks, Andeep. Uh, so hi, I'm, I'm Dipanita, I go by Dee. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Sorcero. Uh, we are a Washington DC based uh, startup that has a language intelligence platform that serves uh, life sciences and insurance companies. So primarily what we help our customers do um, is optimize and speed up a lot of the work that's driven by regulated content or medical science. So our end customers are often, end users are often doctors and engineers and so forth. Um, yeah, so that's us. Uh, let me see who's next, uh, Yossi. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'm Yossi Levy. I am co-founder and CEO of getacard.com. Um, what we do is we're e-commerce for used cars. So, you know, a, a, many of us have had uh, the dreadful uh, car dealership experience when buying a car. And so we, we simplify the process and we own the entire experience end to end. Uh, so you buy a car from us online and we deliver it to your door. Hey, Ajit, I think you need to come off. Uh, you're you're <laughs> moving right now. So I'll pass it on to someone else. Uh, Agit, <laughs> Agit, you're muted. I think you need to unmute. In, in the lower left-hand corner, there should be a microphone right there. Uh, 
I am unmuted now. Okay. There we go. Thank yeah, you. I am back to technology. I'm Matthew <laughs> George. I'm the founder of Second Chances Farm uh, in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, I am the, uh, this, we are an indoor vertical farm, hydroponic uh, farm that's at scale. And what makes us interesting and unusual, uh, even by indoor vertical farms, is we only hire inside the farm returning citizens, people who have served their time and repaid their debt to society. So that's what we do. Awesome. So in the name of technical difficulties, um, viewers, we know that uh, uh, some of you are, are mentioning that you can't see it in grid. If you're manually able to do that, there should be an option up in the right hand corner to switch to grid view to see everyone um, at the same time. But if not, we're just going to keep this show going. Um, <laughs> so we're going to throw up a poll here, an audience poll. Um, we're going to ask folks, if you lead, work at, or work with an early stage company, how has COVID-19 impacted company plans? If we want to get that poll up, um, and we'll talk about the results uh, panels later on. But let's kick this off. Um, so for all of you, you're in different stages um, of, of how this pandemic is affecting your companies. How did you know the world had changed? Was it the day you saw that social distancing order? Was it before that? Um, what was that moment for you where you were like, wow, this is real and it's going to impact my company from here on out in a major way? Well, anyone, uh, anyone can take it. Uh, ahead, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to start it because I probably am the perfect canary in the in the in the mine, uh, we started our farm, recruited our first cohort of ten returning citizens on January sixth. Set up the farm the first week in February. Planted over two hundred thousand seeds to harvest on March sixteenth. Our first group of customers was high-end restaurants. We had pre-sold everything. Take six weeks to grow. Uh, we were going to deliver on March 17th. We harvest on March 16th. We started the har first harvest on March 16th in the morning. And at three o'clock that day, the governor of Delaware issued a order shutting down all restaurants at eight o'clock that day. So we went from 100% pre-sold to zero sales with a perishable product that we were harvesting. And so we had to figure out whether we shut down or pivot. And I'm happy to talk about the pivoting when the time is right. But that was the moment when I know my world ended as I knew it at that point. <laughs> World ended, I'm like, <laughs> anyone else want to speak to that? So I can go next. I mean, for me personally, I think uh, I was uh, just uh, traveling back from India sometime in early February and I've already like seen things change in airports and the screening and things like that. But uh, for us, from a user standpoint, we've started receiving a lot of uh, feedback in terms of how uh, care has shifted completely from like physical visits to like online and like telemedicine. Uh, so again, I think as Ajit mentioned, we've had to make a quick uh, solution uh, that can help patients uh, thrive and kind of uh, take care of their health uh, in the current circumstances. So again, I can go into detail in terms of what that change has been for us as well. Yeah, um, I can go next. So uh, I actually remember the date really, really clearly. It was March 12th and it was largely triggered because someone was visiting us in office and we later found out that he had fever and that was it. And uh, we immediately sort of went on overnight, the entire team went remote. I think uh, for us from a business standpoint, it hasn't thankfully negatively impacted us. But what it did do is that it dramatically changed our, our go-to-market strategy around certain verticals that we immediately, um, you know, sort of pushed for maybe six, seven months down the line, verticals like supply chain that we were thinking about addressing straight away. It also really put a dampener on our, um, you know, on our sort of our, our office um, sort of, um, offsite planning that we were doing. And that was really important because we are a somewhat distributed team. So in terms of team building, and we just hired a bunch of new people, that's, that's made uh, onboarding very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, hey, it's Matt. Um, yeah, we started seeing, um, we run a global business uh, and so, uh, I've got customers in places like Asia and in Italy um, who were just slowing down, um, you know, their processes. And that started kind of in early February, as we'd say that kind of uh, gave us the early warning sign. Uh, similarly to D, we, we had an offsite planned in February uh, and I had a bunch of folks that were traveling internationally and we kind of just said, maybe we should just hit the pause button. You know, there's no need to, like, we could do this virtually. We'll give it a try. Um, and we did and it worked. And, and I think that was kind of proof point uh, number one that we can work virtually. Um, as a global team. Um, 
I would say as a cyber company, we really started to see um, what I would call threats and attacks really start to pick up uh, in the early March timeframe. Uh, and we've posted a, a bunch of data on our website at, at clean.io. You can go to our blog. There's a couple of blogs there about what we saw in March and then what we saw kind of persist through April. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's been kind of, uh, you know, warning signs in, in a couple different places. And, and um, you know, we've seen the impacts uh, surge and, uh, you know, it's been interesting for our business. I, I, you know, I think it's, uh, unfortunately, it's kind of been okay and good for our business. Definitely. Um, I want to do two call outs here in the middle. If you guys can see Terry, he's doing a live graphic illustration of this. I'm always, always so fascinated. Um, also, we, we saw some of those poll results. Um, they went away, but about 39% of you said uh, this has changed in a good and bad way. So kind of neutral. And then right behind that was 22% saying it negatively um, has impacted you. Um, so yeah, let's on thinking about that. Um, going into our next question, what has kept working? What has been challenging? Ajit, you remembered stuff. You mentioned some pivoting. Um, so this is where you guys can also talk um, about pivots. D, you said for your business, it hasn't changed your business um, directly as much, but some other things are are changing. So if you guys want to talk about challenges um, and what has kept working, and, and what have you had to do? Have you had to return to basics? Okay. So I will simply say that. For us, we had never ever planned as a business model because we're a large production farm to sell to individuals in, or retail in any shape or form. We were selling it to either grocery stores or to restaurants. So that was our marketplace. Uh, so we were harvesting on Monday the 16th when all of this happened and the 17th we were delivering to restaurants, which we didn't do. So when you deliver to restaurants, you don't have to individually package stuff. You don't have to, you know, it's above packaging. Uh, and so uh, we obviously didn't have that marketplace. So we first had to figure out uh, what do we do with all this produce and what do we do going forward? Because I had a group of 10 returning citizens that were counting on me to uh, keep them working. And so we ended up launching just as a lark, a farm to home, farm to table home delivery program that was open to two counties in Pennsylvania and one county in Delaware. We didn't have any method or program for delivery because we never had thought about it. And we also didn't have packaging, but we put it up. First thing was marketing. I figured if there's customers, we'll find a way to solve it. So we put it up on the website. We emailed everybody on our list. Uh, we, uh, uh, we had a fairly large following. Much to our surprise, there was an incredible reaction, positive reaction. And so then the next challenge was packaging it because people did not know what bok choy was. So we had to put labels on things as opposed to restaurants and chefs that would know what bok choy was. And then we had to figure out how to deliver it. So over the course of the next four weeks, we ended up selling out uh, everything we produced and we have a large clientele that is home delivery that some of them have gone through their second renewal now we are into our eighth week of harvest today and tomorrow is our delivery we have learned more about delivering and being in the retail side and what it means to be individual retail and we might have just found a new business model for for this that we never anticipated uh, and the un unintentional consequence of this was that the people who are buying it uh, have turned out to be a fan club and many of them want to visit us and potentially invest in us when, the, <laughs> when, when it's open that is something I had never thought because we have a captive audience that really most most of it like the 86% we did a survey of them loved our product and thought we were superior and so that was my pivoting story so thank you I, I love that thank you so for, for for us it was it was pretty interesting because um when we, we had a really big demand shock um right right as things started so we, we could kind of tell you know we're a consumer business so you know we we could kind of tell it was you know it's continuing to get demand was continuing to lower although um what was interesting is that after you know like say in the last couple of weeks we, we were actually shut down for a month because of the government but in the last couple of weeks we've we've completely shifted our marketing from you know our value proposition was always like hey you know you should buy a car online because you know for many reasons but it's just so much easier and this is you know the preferred method and now it's like hey you you kind of have to buy a car online you know people you know people need transportation um, you know, people are, you know, going to be hailing rides less and, you know, we don't know kind of the long-term impact. Although now it's like, Hey, we're, we're the superior way to buy a car online. You know, we, we like to say like, would you order Chinese food from an Italian restaurant? So no. Right. So like we're, we specialize in this. So it's, it's been, 
uh, it's been it's been pretty interesting to see kind of consumer um, you know reaction and, and kind of us in this new world how we function in it. Um, I can go next. So, uh, as I alluded to in the introduction, for us, it's been really about people and hiring and still continue to build a really strong culture with a lot of new people coming on, on board. Um, so right before COVID really hit, we had strategically decided that we were going to center all of our U.S. hiring in the D.C. area. And that was really important because we wanted everyone in the U.S. to be in the same office. Uh, so that was one kind of hiring strategy. As soon as COVID hit, we started scanning all the layoff lists and we changed our hiring strategy from just doing sort of open you know, postings on Indeed or LinkedIn or wherever and focused purely on hiring off of the layoff lists. Um, and then it, and the, one of the big decisions we're trying to take is, does that mean we just hire from anywhere in the US? So does it not any longer matter where a person is? We're also dealing with the fact that there is severe Zoom exhaustion and uh, folks on the team are feeling the strain of jumping from one video call to another, to another, to another for eight straight hours of calls. So how do you manage that exhaustion as well? So it's been, it, for me, I'm, I'm spending a lot of my time thinking about that. And that's what we're working through is how do we plan for being remote and growing and hiring for at least the rest of 2020. Um, and, and so that, that's, that's been an incredible amount of thinking around team building online, which for a distributed technology company is proving to be much more nuanced and interesting than I thought it would be. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I found it super interesting. Like as entrepreneurs, we are challenged every day to you know, learn new muscles that we didn't think we had or didn't think we would know or that we would need. Um, you know, for me, um, you know, balancing that, that home life and that work life. I think like this is outside of the business. Like I've got three kids that are getting homeschooled on video and zoom every day. Uh, and so balancing that environment, I think it's been really challenging. Uh, as you can see, I'm actually in the office today. I was um, just going to comment on the backdrop. Well, I'm, well, I'm <laughs> I love the backdrop, the wall that's, right here. That's real. That's, that's, real. that's great. <laughs> but I, I think one of the things that we did in the early days, um, because when we were reading the news and seeing what was happening out in the outside world, like outside of the United States, um, we were really preparing for the worst. Um, and obviously it's, it's been bad and it's been challenging. Um, but never did I think that we'd be like developing a disaster recovery plan as a very small startup as to like, Hey, what happens if I'm sick and I'm in the hospital and I'm on a ventilator, like who has the keys? And so I think that like, we went through a lot of, uh, doomsday type, uh, scenarios with our team just to make sure that we knew, uh, you know, who was in charge and, and, uh, who was the backup and who was the backup to the backup. Uh, and so I think that was a, a real interesting process. And, and then just on a demand strategy uh, uh, side, we really had to take a step back and really, you know, uh, I would say have an empathetic lens as to how we were going to market and how can we be of service to our customers and make sure that they do not experience disruption. And then also on a, on a you know, bringing in new customers, you know, how do we lean in and, and how do we adapt and, and uh, you know, just not be tone deaf in this environment, right? Because I think there's a lot of folks that are struggling revenue wise. And, you know, it's like, how can we lean in and help? I think that's kind of the real, the real thing that we've tried to do to differentiate. Definitely. Yeah, for us, I think uh, being a healthcare company, uh, what uh, this uh, pandemic has exposed is kind of like the shortages, whether it is like in hospitals, like the doctors, but more importantly, patients are more anxious than ever before. Right. So uh, for us being uh, this company where we wanted to help patients always stay on top of their health, we've noticed that uh, most of these encounters, clinical visits are online right now when like, they have to do this like telemedicine uh, play. So we've seen a lot of patients kind of report that to us and we've been like observing the space for a, a while now. So it took us like a week or two to quickly uh, spin up a telephone based solution where doctors can uh, use an abridged enabled uh, phone number to reach out to patients and have the care conversation uh, so that patients are like more uh, present during the conversations because they can uh, always stay confident that they can refer back to the recordings uh, all the time. And we have uh, a machine learning pipeline that generates those summaries for them. So in terms of how we've been able to shift very quickly from uh, like purely being this uh, app where patients use in the clinical visits in the office to something where patients can use it uh, like during phone calls and things like that. I think that's been uh, really impactful. But more than anything, we've also seen government take uh, very quick steps in terms of uh, enabling and relaxing uh, privacy policies when it comes to telemedicine visits. 
uh, and actually uh, like enabling some billing practices where uh, doctors can get paid at the same level as uh, video and in-office visits. So some of those things acted as tailwinds and we acted really fast to ensure that we uh, capture the opportunity and uh, help patients kind of uh, navigate this crisis. And I think uh, Satya Nadella has put it rightly when he said that Microsoft has seen uh, like two years worth of digital transformation in two months, but for healthcare, it's been more like 10 years worth of transformation in a month. So, I mean, it's, it's been like really uh, kind of like, I think mixed feelings being at the center of that journey, uh, but uh, really pleasant to have helped patients uh, navigate this at the end of the day. Definitely, thank you. Thank you all for sharing, pivoting a little bit. Um, how did you first express to your team that your world was changing? D, you said you remember the exact day and moment that this all kind of happened. Um, but not only just talking about talking about how you first expressed it, how was it received by your team members um, um, from that point? Anyone can go ahead and, and take the rings and share it. And if you weren't the one who delivered that message, what did it feel like to receive it? Well, I, I would say for me, the hardest part was I had a whole bunch of people uh, 10 returning citizens and five members of my leadership team sort of looking for me to pull a rabbit out of the hat. Uh, and I'm not a magician and I haven't ever, I mean, as an entrepreneur, you always pull rabbits out of the hat, but you never have to do it within 24 hours or your entire production goes out of stuff. And what I told them is I have no idea on Monday the 16th what was going to happen, but I was going to do everything in my power not to fail. That, uh, that I would go, I would, I would put everything I knew to make it work. And that we'll come back in tomorrow, we'll package like we have customers, and we are going to find a way to make it happen. What they wanted was reassurance that I wasn't bailing out of the ship or that I had given hope. It put a lot of stress on me because I couldn't share how anxious I was, but they were looking at my face for hope. And what I, and, and I would say, for me, it is all about resilience and hope surviving this. Is, and when you have a team, and particularly in my case, returning citizens who have experienced a lot of hardships in prisons, they really wanted to not feel like they were once again, uh, uh, you know, found to be victims of some other crisis that they didn't have it. So it was well received, but I think it put an incredible uh, energy focus on me to give energy. So they, they watch my mood and attention every single day. It's been business as usual for us. That's all I would say. <laughs> like, like, I mean, it's just people are doing it in different locations. Uh, we actually just moved into this location uh, on, on February the 1st. I remember that day, Dee. Um, and yeah, we, we were across the harbor in Baltimore here in a, in a, in a spaces location and, and we were sardined into a, you know, a tiny room with 10 people. And we finally now have 4,000 square feet here in Baltimore. And like three weeks later, everyone's working from home. So I, I think the team is excited to get back to this because this is where we've created, you know, team and culture and, and presence and that sort of stuff. But you know, we're doing what everybody else is doing, the virtual happy hours and, you know, trying to do as much of this and FaceTime and, and just make sure that you stay connected and, uh, you know, communicate, like just over, over communicate so that, uh, you know, you're uber transparent. I think transparency builds trust and kind of hopefully eliminates the fear, uncertainty and doubt of these situations. And, um, hopefully, you know, keeps everybody from a mental health perspective, not going crazy by not seeing and shaking hands and all that sort of stuff that you would normally do. Yes. Yeah. So sort of just building on what Matt just said, you know, we, we had, uh, we were expanding our team. So we were just starting to look at real estate. Let me just say that that got put on pause. So we had like outlined a new office in the summer and maybe May or June and so on and so forth. That got put on pause, but we did a bunch of really tactical things. So first and foremost, you know, an early stage startup is risky at any time of the of the year, but it's particularly risky now. So the first thing was to reassure the existing team on the financial stability of the company and that we had runway not for one, but two. And, you know, just really explaining that nothing on the financial side for them was going to change because this was not going to be a great time for them to jump ship anyway. Uh, that was one. Number two is instituting we already have a fairly friendly leave and family care policy, but really doubling down on that. So sort of insisting that everybody take between one and seven days off in preparation that didn't count towards their PTO, but allowed them time to quote unquote prepare whatever preparation meant for them. Some of our, some of our uh, team members have, uh, you know, children, differently able children. So a different kind of care, different working hours. So working with each individual on the team to make sure that the working hour structure for them works with childcare, et cetera, et cetera. So that was a lot of work that went in there. Um, for, 
for a full two weeks while our visitor was in recovery and we weren't sure if it was COVID or not, I sent a daily health bulletin at the same time every single day, sort of saying, okay, this is the single source of truth. So it was a bulletin on his health, but also a bulletin on all of our health. So again, to Matt's point about succession planning at an early stage startup, some of us, including myself, had met with him. So making sure that the team knew that we were in good health was also important. So we did a lot of that. And then mental health days. Suddenly mental health, which was a little more subtle, became a big topic of conversation. Uh, you know, we opened up a full Friday so the entire team could just vent and voice everything that they were worried about. So give, creating a very safe, inclusive, non-trite space to talk about the state of your sanity or lack thereof was, was really helpful. So those kind of tactical things we did. I'm going to, I'm going to cut in right here because you, you both D and Matt talked about transparency. Do you guys think, uh, is there such thing as too much transparency during such a chaotic time? You just, D, you just talked about an entire health bulletin, which I think is amazing. Um, do you guys think there's a such thing as too much transparency or that that's not even a thing? So I'll say that what Matt and Dee said, you know, pretty much sums up what we did. Uh, pretty much carbon copy. We also, we have a tech office overseas. We just leased a space in early February. We were, you know, you know, our overseas team was in a co-working space prior to that. Um, and also, you know, with being over communicative, that's exactly what we did. We doubled up our, um, you know, our company all hands meetings. You know, we, we did a lot of things so that people could, you know, just tell them as much as we can. But I think that to your question about transparency, um, you know, it's okay to, to not know, to not have answers. You know, people, like people seem to, especially in the beginning, you know, like in March, there was a peak fear. And people just wanted to, to hear like, you know, like from, from, you know, leadership, like what is going on. And, you know, you simply don't always have the answers, you know, and, and a lot of times you don't, but as long as you just, you know, stay communicative, you, you know, we were very transparent with every step of the process. Um, and, you know, it, it seemed like just a, a big, a big chunk of it was really um, even, even after the first couple of weeks of like shelter in place was just morale. You know, we were like, we're a company that was completely shut down. Uh, so it's, you know, it's really tough because you want to, you know, you want everyone to stay motivated. Um, and so the, the, the best, the best way is just really transparency and explaining any develop, developments possible that, you know, getting us one step closer to running the business again. So that was that, you know, in hindsight, it was very successful. So. Yeah, I think just echoing what uh, you also mentioned, uh, I mean, transparency uh, for any company is important, but I think companies like of our stage, like early stage companies, it is very important to like build, establish and deepen trust. And more than anything, I think it like boosts the team morale, which is very important uh, during times like this, because we're all in, in this together. And if you want to build this company together, I think we need to come to overcome it and be transparent. Uh, so kind of, I think, uh, adopting a very flat hierarchy and like, always uh, exchanging important things and like being connected all the time uh, really helped us uh, kind of overcome the communication barrier as well because especially being remote I think that kind of pops up all the time are the things happening uh, behind like uh, other like behind the curtain like uh, is everyone not like, being exposed to the important things so always organizing meetings ensuring that we sync up every single day uh, has been crucial too. Awesome. So how are you guys, uh, this is just a, a one-off question, but how are you guys staying connected and transparent with your teams? Is it Slack, Google Hangouts, Zoom? I have some, some people I take meetings with that they are hard Google Hangout users won't use Zoom and vice versa. Um, are you using something different? Those are like the three big, you know, three big apps I've seen uh, getting a lot of usage right now. So if you guys are doing oh, something different. Yeah, sure. yeah. I, I actually love to speak to that because we, we did end up doing something different. Initially, some of our customers, you know, were very regulated, uh, were uncomfortable with some of the security issues that were popping up with Zoom. So their legal team wouldn't sign off on us using Zoom. Uh, you know, we're big fans of open source. So we went and set up Jitsi uh, and Jitsi is not only end to end encryption, it's it's open source software. So uh, we now use Jitsi for all of our internal standups, which is every morning. We still have a, a big chunk of our external meetings on Zoom, but internally we're slowly moving over to Jitsi and sort of configuring that more and more uh, to work for us. Uh, again, I, we use Slack, we use Zoom primarily, but, and we're on G Suite, we don't really do Hangouts. The rest of us is customer driven. You wanna do a Hangout, you wanna send a Skype, 
you know, they're the boss of us sometimes. So <laughs> they, they with that. But from our own internal, it's now on Jitsi and we're really, really enjoying using it. Awesome. Anyone else? We are. A, we were deemed an essential business because we are producing food. So we have daily. Uh, everybody's here. So I am one of the few people that didn't get to watch any Netflix or any movies. Uh, work <laughs> seven days a week. I haven't been bored at home. In fact, I haven't been home less than I ever have been. Um, and uh, so we start. Though we start every morning with a briefing meeting with everybody, uh, so that we can. Uh, LA concerns and we end the day with a very short briefing. So we are physically, believe it or not, we see everybody physically, we get to see them physically. Somewhat dangerous, we wear masks, but we are, of course, being in the uh, being in the food safety business, there's a lot of food safety issues we address with USDA and FDA. Uh, but it's for us, it's very, very different to be in place, so. Awesome. All right, we have a, a, a question here. Oh, this is someone with Jim would like to share a document. Jim, we can we can get that figured out um, um, after the panel for sure. Thank you. That's awesome. All right, moving on. So it's been said that nobody kept market product market fit when COVID hit. Have you had to go back to basics or has your business changed as a whole? Ajit, you kind of touched on this already, how your business is more so growing with the fan base now. Is well, we, 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 have, we have changed. We have added, we, we have, we are, I think this week we are going to make a final decision if this is a permanent change because we have gone through two cycles of renewals because initially I didn't think we would ever want to do home delivery. So I didn't want to promise more than four weeks of home delivery. So I charged people for four weeks of home delivery up front thinking I would never have to ask them for renewal. People are now asking, can I put them on uh, automatic renewal, can they sign up for a year? None of which I anticipated or wanted. So we are now going to the place where we are seriously setting up, okay, if this is going to be a real operational model, uh, we cannot run this uh, the informal way we did it and uh, how do we do it right? So how do we package food to be delivered home in the summer is different from in school because we, we leave, it's no contact delivery. So if you leave it outside, lettuce is going to get warm. So we're thinking through the challenges of it, but I think uh, we would have a riot uh, and particularly we would lose some bad will from people who might be potential investors if we suddenly said we're not gonna do it. So we are dedicating uh, essentially uh, at the thought between now and the end of May to really to create a permanent new outlet and uh, and then that will be a whole new it'll be one part of our business but it'll be an interesting part of business and uh, one that uh, I never intended but we are definitely pivoting to making our new operation this part of our marketplace permanent. Awesome. Anyone else want to speak to that? Um, sure. So uh, for us, uh, it's sort of taken, a, it's done two things. One is, um, you know, bird in hand worth two in the bush, which means that we are doubling down on expanding within our current customers instead of just constantly trying to get the next new customer. Uh, you know, we have relationships that we've built over a couple of months, you know, in the averaging six month odd sales cycle, and we're doubling down on that instead of just he investing heavily in, in getting new leads. So that's been different. So our emphasis is much more on, on customer success and technical account management than it has been on just sales. So that's one. Um, I think the second part which has happened is that we were really starting to travel a lot to Europe where a lot of our customer base is moving to or is. Um, and in the absence of that being a possibility, uh, we are again looking to, we're going back to our pipeline and digging up customers who have been particularly impacted by COVID and could really use our software right now. So we've kind of gone back to them and said, hey, if there's anything we can support you with, now is a good time to let us know. So, um, and that's, elicited some really, really great results. And we've been able to support some really key industries and key players uh, by just sort of helping them through a particular time, even if they may have forgotten about us. So that's been, and last but certainly not the least, we're doing the slow down to go fast approach, which is, you know, across the team, the agreement is we have 60 days to get our house in order. So all of the things that we did, we haven't been doing because we were moving really fast, this is the time to do it. So the plans and the structuring. So any sort of slowness on the customer end is an opportunity for us to get our house in order. So we're this is sort of how we've dealt with it so far. Definitely. 
uh, I'm going to pivot a little bit. We have some questions um, from attendees. First one is actually for you, Terry. Um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this. I see that you're on mute. Um, but someone is wondering what you're using to make this infographic. Uh, I am using an iPad Pro, 12.9 inches. And are you are you drawing this like from scratch in like Illustrator or or no, something? I'm actually using a program called Procreate, which is uh, here I can share my face, uh, which is uh, kind of the standard drawing program that a lot of people. It's not standard, but it's it's very commonly used on an iPad, yeah, and an Apple Pencil. Awesome. I'm very intrigued. I've been watching you the entire time. So thank you, Terry. Can't wait to see the finished product. Um, all right, we have another question from Miriam Kelly. Has anyone found that they are undercapitalized under the current situation versus what was originally budgeted for? This looks like a, a funding financial venture capital question. Um, anyone? I mean, I can answer. I, I think for us, we don't really know what the impacts will be from a financial perspective, right? So we have a plan, we've got an operating plan. We, you know, we hit our Q1 number. Um, we have increased demand for our products. Um, but I think what we're seeing is that some of our customers have actually uh, felt the impact, right? So many of our customers are, you know, big websites uh, that rely on advertising. Uh, and as you can imagine, many advertisers have taken a little bit of a step back in this environment because they can't drive people to a retail location to, to spend money, you know? So I think for us, it's a wait and see. And I think, um, you know, I think we'll uh, just be cautious and, and uh, you know, and, and make our investments accordingly. I think that's, that's our plan. Um, there's a lot we don't know yet about what the longer term impacts are going to be from COVID. So we're just uh, being cautious. We were anticipating a, a get going for another round of investing, and we've been talking with investors uh, for the month of March because we wanted to show our first harvest and show a sort of proof that we can actually deliver uh, in an indoor vertical farm at scale. And so uh, all of those investors said, ah, oh, it, it's, it's congratulations on your first harvest. Great job pivoting. Uh, we'll talk to you later when we feel, understand what's going on. So we are managing to skate along, uh, which, uh, which is fine, but our ability to expand because we are planning, we have a 47,500 square foot building that we wanted to expand to our next portion of that building uh, is definitely delayed because I think uh, in, uh, investors have no idea what the world looks like. All the good news is that the this pandemic showed that there was a real disruption in the food uh, world and the supply chain and buying locally, uh, buying stuff that was not touched uh, by human hand and uh, that is chemical free. So uh, what I'm hoping is when we come out of it in June or July, uh, there some of the investors will realize that we are, we have a marketplace that might actually uh, be proven to be an important vital link uh, to solving when there is a pandemic or a major crisis. So uh, that's what our hope is, but you never know. I think there's definitely a pullback on uh, investors, people are hoarding cash and uh, waiting to see, frankly, where they should invest if any anytime soon. So, but we are surviving, and by uh, but this, we were hoping to expand rather than survive. So, yeah, definitely. All right, I'm going to actually move on to the next question. Um, after the Great Recession, we actually saw a decline in entrepreneurship. Do you guys predict that that same decline will happen um, post pandemic, or do you see something different happening? This is a different time. So I think it's, I think it's completely, um, I think it's actually a great catalyst for like any, any real entrepreneurs, anyone that truly wants to start a business because, you know, we, we had, we had like, uh, you know, this period of just so much demand, um, and you know, everything, a lot of things got so efficient and suddenly, you know, everything got, you know, shook up in, in a month and consumer demand just started shifting to different things. And so I think it's, it's almost like what a true entrepreneur has been waiting for in a way where there's all these new opportunities that it's, you know, I'm not necessarily a free for all, but there's just, you know, a lot more opportunities than you would possibly have maybe a couple months back when, you know, we had these 10, 10 years of just, just an expansion economy where, you know, just demand completely exceeded, you know, supply in, in many, many different areas. So I, I think, I think it's a great opportunity for people that want to, you know, start companies, um, you know, funding might be tricky. Um, it definitely hasn't dried up. Uh, I'm not a VC, but you know, it, it really depends on, you know, what, this is not like a recession by any means, you know, you have companies that are, you know, excelling like never before, 
So it just it comes down to, you know, the person, you know, the company. And um, yeah, ultimately, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity. I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's always going to be great ideas. And uh, as you as you kind of suggested, uh, there's a lot of capital uh, and, um, you know, they're, they're looking to invest in entrepreneurs. Um, my last experience prior to here was with a startup in Baltimore called Millennial Media. Uh, we were founded in 2006. Um, if, if anybody remembers 2008 and 2009, those were challenging times. Uh, and our company went public on the New York Stock Exchange in 2012. So, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, there's always going to be great ideas and, you know, you just got to be focused and heads down and, uh, and execute well. Definitely. Uh, the, the one other thing that uh, that has become pretty obvious is uh, that in, in, a, in a very consumer driven, high demand economy, there were lots of very interesting, cool things that were coming to market. And I think that's changing a lot. We're very easily able to distill between needs and wants. Uh, so, you know, the, the entrepreneurs were able to really zero in on what that unchanging need is and build companies around that will really do well. I was also reading a very interesting blog posts. Some of the biggest companies today were built around the recession and grew around the recession and did their best work around the recession. And um, so, yeah, I, I still feel incredibly hopeful about, about entrepreneurs who will zero in on the unchanging wants and build companies around that. Definitely. I think moreover, unlike 2001 and 2009, uh, this pandemic uh, has hit like sectors like travel, hospital, hospitality extremely hard. But other sectors uh, like remote companies are I think like blooming, like Zoom and Discord, and they've like really uh, gone up. So I think there is definitely a lot of opportunity in being able to like find uh, really niche spaces where we can like really go uh, big. And I was just checking news this morning, and even yesterday there were like 20 new investments made into startups. So, I mean, I don't think this is stopping anytime soon. Definitely. All right, I'm gonna actually skip to our last question. We're gonna wrap up in a few minutes, um, but I wanna hear from everyone on this question. Um, when we check back in with you in a year, where can you hope your company to be? Anyone can go first. <laughs> Adji, you look like you wanna talk. My, well, no, so the, my hope, my promise to my returning citizens is that we will be have at least two farms, and my first hemp farm, which I'm a licensed uh, hemp grower, will be fully blo blooming and growing. And that we are a stand waiting list of people wanting to come work for us uh, to create a whole new crop of compassionate capitalists, which is what we call what we try to do with this, folks. So, is to look back and say, you remember that day on March 16th when we had all that harvest and we had no idea what we were going to do. We 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 got back our customer base, uh, and we are. And more importantly, we have survived, thrived, and uh, grew. I am being bullish because being that's the only choice I have. I don't think there's any other choice. I am sort of determined to prove that if I survive through this, then I can survive through anything. So it is sort of like a warrior attitude that I'm having. Veteran, I'm a veteran of this, so uh, and I'm proving that if I'm good enough to make it through this, I should be made good enough to make it through the uh, through a decent economic cycle. So that's we hope to have multiple farms. Uh, Philadelphia here, uh, large scale, and uh, hire a lot of people who are returning citizens. So, yeah. Uh, for us, I think we measure our success based on how helpful we've been to patients. Uh, so I think now is the real test for us as a company as we see these cases uh, still going up. So I'm hoping that we emerge out of this situation having helped a lot of patients navigate the crisis and hoping we've uh, helped a lot of patients stay on top of their health. Yeah, for me, we raised money uh, a year ago. So a year from now, I hope we've raised quite a bit more money. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I would love to see us uh, with a you know, substantial number on the balance sheet so that we can fund that next wave of growth for us. We've had an incredible amount of success in the last year and a half. And I think, you know, I kind of see this in chunks of, of, of time. So I think it'll be also be the new normal. Like we don't know what nor like the normal that we experienced prior to eight weeks ago, who knows what that new normal is going to be going forward. And um, so you know, I think it's just, you know, figuring out how to cope with the new normal and, um, but hopefully we're back in this office a year from now. <laughs> with that cool wall, I hope so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I, 
I can go next. Um, so, so in about a year, so we have a, a, I expect to have gone, so we're in year three of our life cycle as a company. We just turned two in April, so still very, very young. Um, so we expect to have cross product market fit and scaling really by the end of next year. That's what, what I expect. That's what our model tells us. And, and showing our team is really capable of measured intelligent experimentation around this time to keep innovating. So that's what I hope to come back with. So we, February was our best month ever. So it kind of sucked going into March. Uh, we, we were like, you know, on top of the world. Uh, but like, you know, like to Matt's point, like we also, you know, we, we um, really raised some money in the end of the year. So, you know, like we're, we're thankful that we're pretty well capitalized. And, and, you know, in the next year, we just hope we can kind of be- get back on that trajectory. Um, you know, kind of get past all of this and, you know, hopefully just, you know, keep, keep the growth growing. Awesome. Well, wow. You guys are right on time. Um, I want to thank you all so much for joining and chatting with me. Um, I want to give a shout out to Terry for the live graphic that I'm so excited to see. Um, also want to give a shout out to my team behind the scenes running the day, especially Katrina and Vincent hosting. It looks a lot harder than I think <laughs> I could be doing right now, um, managing this many people. So, Shout out to the Technically Media team. Shout out to all of you. Um, we are going to head out in our next session at 1 p.m. We'll be talking about what now for corporate innovation. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Great Thanks. to meet Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Thanks. Good well.